Okay. Welcome everyone. Uh, in the last session uh, of uh, the last year of the Simpa School, and uh, uh, our to Danish now to host this particular session online. <laughs> our to Danish. Okay. Uh, we have Professor Carlos for his last lecture, and it is probably the tutorial session. So let's start the tutorial session. Professor Carlos, over to you. All right. Um, yes, so it's a bit um, unfortunate that not uh, all the participants are here. I want to make this since it's a tutorial. I want this to, to be um, interactive. So um, let's let's try. So last time, I, we talked about algebraic identifiability, uh, global identifiability, generic identifiability, uh, these, these different notions that what we have for graphs. And uh, maybe as a quick reminder, I have this still from the notes here. Uh, so, Global identifiable means that the parameterization map is injected. And generic to identifiable means that it's, uh, the fibers are singletons generically. And algebraically means that the fibers are finite generically. OK? And so we have these three examples. Um, and I, I gave some problems of homework. For, for this, and one of them was to show that uh, in this case, the cycle, the free cycle, this is an example of algebraic identifiability. So I chose some particular parameters, omega and lambda. So namely, omega 1 is 1, omega 2 is 2, omega 3 is 4, and then lambda 1, 2 is 1 half, lambda 2, 3 is 2, and lambda 3, 1 is 1 half. So part of the exercise was just computing <laughs> this and verifying that the answer was given by this, this matrix, 16, 12, 28, um, 10, 12, 10, 10, 22, 22, 22, 28, 22, 52. And the question uh, to you was whether you could find a different set of parameters that gives the same covariance matrix. So that was the, the exercise. And well, I, I don't know if anybody can communicate through Zoom, um, but if anybody uh, managed to do this, this would be great if someone wants to communicate the solution, <laughs> just by any chance. So maybe the participants who did it are not there yet. But um, OK, I'm going to give you the answer. And so the answer is there. the other set of parameters that works is the omega is this matrix. So omega 1, 16 over 13. Omega 2 is 5. And omega 3 is 26 over 5. And the lambda matrix um, there will be a five fourths, a thirteen fifths, and the last um, lambda free one has to be eight over thirteen. Okay, so that's another case where you can check if you compute identity minus lambda minus transpose times omega times identity minus lambda inverse, it will give you the same covariance matrix here. And so that's uh, that's interesting for sure, right? And so, but this means indeed we don't have this uh, global identifiability that we would like, because given sigma, there are multiple sets of parameters that give us the same sigma. And this is in general an issue, right? Um, However, in this case, I claim it's algebraic, which means that there are only finitely many. And you can show that for this cycle, <laughs> the, the size of the fibers 
is two. So if you do phi inverse of phi of theta, in this case, you're going to get two generically. And so this is the only other option in this case. Okay, so that's why it was a nice exercise. And in a similar vein, we had this um, two cycle, which is not identifiable. And well, in this case, I gave you some parameters, namely these. And again, we have a covariance matrix that you can check that this is the, the right one. And this is the parameterization. So I explicitly, so I write it down for you. And now the claim was not identifiable. So this means that you can find infinitely many lambdas and omegas that make this work. So phi g will map to this particular uh, matrix. And the, in this case, the exercise um, was to find such infinitely many parameters. And here I have already the, the answer. Um, well, one possible answer, well, this one way I chose to parameterize things. So lambda to one is a free parameter. Um, and for each value of lambda to one, I get different values for lambda one, two, omega one, and omega two that will make this work. And by make this work, I mean, you know, they, when you plug in these parameters, you will obtain the matrix. So for example, um, the one that we were uh, discussing, so this was this one here, where lambda to one is two. So if, let's check, right? So if lambda to one is two, then if you substitute here, eight times two is 16, minus 13 is three, and 13 times two is 26, minus 23 is three, so this implies that then lambda one, two is one. Then if we substitute here, uh, omega two, uh, what do we have? We have 23 minus 26 plus eight. Um, and so that is how much? So this minus three plus eight is five, right? So that means that omega two is five. And omega one, you just need to substitute the value of lambda to one, which is two. And so we get uh, 32 minus 52 plus 23. 32 minus 52 plus 23. And what does that give us? Should be three, right? Three. Should be three. Yes, thank you. Three. And so this omega one is three. So you can see that we recover indeed the original parameters that I chose. Right? So, but this is for each value, I can change lambda to one. I can make it zero, for example. Uh, well, zero is not a great point, but okay. I can make it zero, which this would mean that this edge disappears. But um, then um, I also get other sets of parameters that. They will give you. Um, okay. So, well, one question would be how did I find, uh, how can one find such uh, solutions? And, well, one way to do this is by, you know, standard regular basis uh, techniques that you learn throughout the school. So, I thought it might be nice to um, show uh, maybe a little bit of Macaulay 2 code um, to compute this. And so I let me do that. And then hopefully you can see, uh, yeah, you can see this. So this is the uh, Macaulay 2 session. And um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it very, uh, you know, just like a direct way. How am I going to do this? So I'm going to define this ring with the variables. In this case, it's omega 1, omega 2, lambda 1, 2, lambda 2, 1. And I'm going to choose a monomial, lexicographic monomial ordering because I want to do elimination. Okay? 
And so, um, okay, and so now what I'm gonna do is this S11, S12, and S22 were the given entries, if you remember. So this I'm just gonna leave here. And now this ideal that I'm defining is exactly the ideal of the, the, the three equations that we get if we wanna solve this map. So this would be, um, if you remember the parameterization I had, you, we had this, uh, the three entries of the matrix, and this was the first one, for example, omega one plus lambda to one squared omega two, divided by this one minus lambda one two lambda to one squared, which appears from this cycle. And so I multiplied it across so that now I get uh, three equations that are actually polynomials. So I don't, I don't wanna be dealing with uh, rational functions. This should be polynomials. So that's why I multiply across. Uh, but the, there is a big, a little bit of an issue there because I mean, this is great. And now I want to study this, this ideal of solutions. But if you see, if I type the dimensions here, I look here, not here, the dimension is two. Okay, so if the dimension is two, that's uh, larger than I expect because lambda one, two, lambda two, one, you could force it to be one. And this gives you, uh, everything makes zero uh, trivially. And you want to avoid this because that was the denominator. That's the determinant of lambda, right? Of identity minus lambda. And we need this to be invertible. So the way to get rid of this is by uh, doing what we also learned during this school, which is saturation. So I can saturate like this. So I saturate by the polynomial one minus lambda one two lambda two one. And then I get a new ideal. And this ideal now is correct one dimension. So the fibers are still infinite as we expected. So now they're one dimensional and that's, that's what it should be. And so, um, then let me then do a Grevner basis for this ideal with this command gens gb. And now it's nice because I can look at the generators. And you can see there are three generators. And these are precisely the solution already. So this is telling me uh, omega 1 equals 8 lambda to 1 squared minus 26 lambda to 1 plus 23 which was what I had. And then omega two is 23 lambda one two squared minus 26 lambda one two plus eight. And the relationship between lambda one two and lambda two one is given by the first equation. So here you can also uh, easily solve for lambda one two in terms of lambda two one, which is the, you know, what I chose to do in the example. Okay, so this was just, um, uh, you know, little snippet of code to show you. Um, and so for example, let's say I wanted to look at the solution, the special solution that we had where we set lambda to one to two. So I can add this to my ideal. And now I do gens gb g zero. And it gives me precisely these parameters that we found, right? So lambda to one is two. That implies that lambda one two is one, omega two is five, and omega one is three, as we as we computed ourselves. Okay. So again, so this was just a small thing I wanted to to show so that I um, uh, actually do it in practice with with my colleague too. Okay. So um, let me go back. So, um, okay, so the other thing I wanted to um, maybe go back to the first tutorial where we were computing ideals. And I think, well, since everybody here likes ideals, um, I wanted to maybe talk a bit more about them and, and tell you about the, the very beautiful combinatorics 
that is lying behind uh, these ideals. So um, if you remember, this is the example we've done already a few times, uh, 1 and 2.23. Um, so does anybody remember what the ideal looks like? What's the vanishing ideal for this graphical model? The question to the audience. I see some people are arriving. That's good. Does anybody remember what the, we, we've seen this example a few times. So someone here, maybe? I have lost yeah. the page. Sure, you lost the page. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So sigma one, two, sigma one, three minus. Almost, that's, that's the one here. Sigma one, two, sigma two, three minus sigma one, three, sigma two, two. It was the... Yes, so that, that's the, the bottom one. Okay, I already wrote it down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is this one. Okay. Sigma one, one, sigma two, three. Minus sigma one two sigma one three two. Um, oh yeah, okay. Maybe you have um, if this one was for the graph, not this one. Oh, I think you have the you're looking at the path. One goes to two goes to two goes to three. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, but this one here. Well, I can I can tell you something. So what should be the entry sigma one two? If you remember the track rule is the sum over all the tracks that go from one to two. But there are no tracks that go from one to two in this graph. Right? Remember, a track has to go like this. Is it sigma so one two? No, exactly. So then sigma one two has to be zero. So sigma one two is actually the ideal in this case. And, um, and yeah, and then this one is this. And OK, if you don't believe me, like, but when we can then do Macaulay too. So let's, let me then switch back and let's do it actually. So, um, where did I put my Macaulay too? Okay, so um, let me, uh, I'm just gonna restart this. And now what we're going to do is we're going to use this package. And so as, um, okay, so maybe since I'm going to be using this uh, many times, I'm going to use this in the buffer. Uh, so needs package graphical models. And I'm going to input the graph. So let's do the first one, the one that we already know the answer. So the notation is here, one goes to three. <laughs> and then I say two goes to three. So you need to give the set of children for each node, everything in brackets. So let's see if this works. <laughs> There you go. And then it says one points to three, two points to three, three points to nothing, right? So three has no children. And so now that we have this, well, I can do some nice things. So for example, I can define the Gaussian ring. So this defines the polynomial ring where the ideal is going to live in. So um, you can see polynomial ring. And I can actually look at the generators of this ideal if you want. So gen R, and you can see here there are the lambdas, automatically creates lambdas. It creates the P's are the omegas. So in this case, these are omega one, omega two, omega three, and the S's are the sigmas. So these are the, the ring, that's the full ring. And you can, for example, if you want to find the lambda, you can do directed edges matrix of R. And so in this case, this is the matrix. And you can see indeed lambda 1, 3, lambda 2, 3. And you can also obtain the Gaussian parameterization. So that's very useful, right? So then you don't need to compute the lambda, 1 minus lambda inverse omega lambda. You can just ask 
for this Gaussian parameterization, and it will give it to you. So you can see here, uh, this should coincide with what we computed. It's also we computed by hand, or well, at least I wrote it everything out. Um, and then you would see that's how we saw the first time that this zero appears, right? And then that's what we said, okay, then everything in the model ha must have a zero coordinate there. And now we can verify this with Gaussian vanishing ideal. So if I do this, you can see the answer is S12, which is the sigma 12, as we knew. And so this is very nice. Um, and now we can use this to use me to, you can just reuse this code. You can just change your graph every time uh, if you have a different one. So if we do the one that, um, what was the second one that was doing? So I claimed this was the one where one is pointing to two and three. Because one points to two, three. So unfortunately, I need to restart it because, um, uh, well, I, I, I don't need to have pink, but sometimes it can get confused if you don't really find the ring. Um, because he thinks like, which one is the Gaussian ring? Then you have to, you have to make sure to, to really find the rings at least. So just on the safe side, that's why I restarted. But okay, so you have Gaussian ring, and now one points two and three. Okay, let's look at lambda. That looks good. And this is the parameterization. So there is no zero anymore, right? And that's why it was harder to think what are the equations in this case. Uh, we expect to have a hypersurface, right? Because uh, the dimension of this model, as we know, is the number of vertices plus the number of edges, which is five. Well, we're in this six dimensional uh, space. And so this is interesting to know, well, what is the relation? And uh, the relation is just the uh, relabeling from the, the one that was we were discussing. So let's do this. There you go. So it says sigma one, two, sigma one, three has to equal sigma one, one, sigma two, three, which you can verify from the parameterization is, is the same calculation as we had before. So this times this, um, sorry, S12, S11, S23. So this times this is exactly um, S12 times S13. Oh, uh, Carlos, uh, uh, just yes. to, uh, I'm, probably I'm forgetting. So uh, <laughs> can we have any uh, combinatorial justification for these generators? Sigma12, Sigma13, Sigma11, Sigma23? Ah, that is a great question. <laughs> and that's the point of what I want to tell you. Yes. Okay. 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 <laughs> so I haven't said it yet. I mean, there is. Uh, we have a probabilistic interpretation of this. So I, I'm gonna come back to this. So that's exactly my next point. Um, let me do one more. Let's keep this one in mind. I, mean, I already have it on my notes, so don't worry. <laughs> we won't forget it. But let's do one more. So we one of the ones I left in the on the first tutorial was this um, diamond graph. So uh, the diamond graph is the one that one points to two, three, two points to four, and three points to four. So it's a, like a directed cycle. So let's do this one and see what the ideal is. So I'm just gonna go directly to the ideal. And the ideal is this, maybe to make it look nice, I do net list. And there are two generators now. So it's the first time that there are two generators. Before there was only a single generator. And this, why does this make sense? You should think about it. Um, this model, now it's on um, four nodes. And we have um, four edges. So it's eight inside a 10 dimensional space, right? Which is five choose two. So it makes sense that we have we need at least two um, two generators to define the ideal, and uh, so this looks very similar. Actually, this is exactly the same as we had before, but now there is a bigger one. So the previous one was toric. This is the first example where we see that this is not toric, 
Um, and this, if you stare at it long enough, you'll see that it is actually a determinant. It's a determinant of a three by three symmetric matrix. Actually, it's the determinant of the sub of a sub matrix um, with rows one, two, and three, and columns two, three, four. Just look at it. Um, and then, of course, the natural question is: These are very nice generators. These are nice determinants. Um, is this always true that I get determinants? Um, how can I interpret these determinants? Right, so these are the natural questions. And I want to tell you the answer in this tutorial. So that's my, my goal. And um, OK, so let's go back to um, my notes. So. All right, so you should be, we should be back. And so we have this. Um, and the, okay, the last one, it was the same. And then, okay, so I'm going to maybe already write it in the nice determinantal form. So it was the determinant of sigma 1, 1, sigma 2, 3, sigma 1, 2. Uh, uh, it should be sigma 1, 3, yeah. sigma 1, 2. And the other one I claim is the determinant of sigma one two, sigma one three, sigma one four, sigma two two, sigma two three, sigma two four, and sigma two three, sigma three three, sigma three four. So this is what we observed. And the question is, what does this mean? Well, everything relies on this amazing property that I told you already about, which is telling you that XA is conditionally independent of XB given XC, if and only if the rank of this matrix is equal to the cardinal of XC. And so, uh, let's, this is exactly what's happening. So we can now interpret whenever we have something like this, this determinant, we can think of them as condition independent statements uh, uh, with this. Uh, Carlos, yes. we can't, we can't see that. Uh, maybe you. Up, oh. Up. oh, 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 this is at the bottom. Oh, oh, I see it's too, too low. Yeah. Too low. We can't see what is written. Okay. That's interesting. Here I can see it. Uh, let me let me move it. Do you see it here in yeah. the top? Yeah, we can see here. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Let me know if. But you you get to see this part. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry. The I I'm highlighting this determinant down here. Yeah. We, uh, this is a determinant we can see. This is okay. We this is we see. So right, even right. even in the IG two case, uh, the determinant is the same. The first generator is the same. It's the same. Exactly. It's the same. So what do these mean? So the first one just means if sigma one, two is zero, that's the easiest case. That means that X one is independent of X two. Um, in this one, well, if you look at the determinant, this is um, sigma with rows one and two and columns one and three. And so if this determinant is zero, this is the same via this nice equivalence as saying that one is independent of three given, oh, sorry, two independent of three given one. One is the common one here. Like this. And so that means that in this uh, particular graph, in both of these, uh, this happens. And one of the things you can realize why this structure is actually here. So G2 is an induced subgraph, right? When you restrict to one, two, three. And uh, that's why uh, the, oh, the, okay. Uh, does it appear in the same? Yes, it appears in the same. 
I was I was hoping I was worried for a moment that there was like different labels, but it's exactly the same. Yeah. One is in the center, and so that's why we see that um, this reappears here, and this one it's a bit uh, it's bigger. But I'm gonna tell you. So this actually means that um, x one and x four are independent. Oh, sorry. X one is conditionally independent of x four, given two and three. I believe uh, we can check because this sub matrix is actually um, the one that has rows one, two, three, and columns two, three, four. If you very, you can verify this, right? So one, two, three, and columns are two, three, four. So the determinant is zero. That means that um, no, the rank of this uh, matrix is two, and uh, that means uh, this thing, again, via this nice characterization. And so this is really nice because it's telling you the algebra is telling you something in probability. It's telling you something about the model itself. And the natural question would be now, how can you like, identify these nice statements? Can you maybe do it directly from the graph? Right? Like this should be something about the graph that um, you don't need to um, you know, do the whole computation and then try to figure out what's going on. <clears throat> and so there is an answer to this and I wanna tell you about it. And so, okay, how to identify? So for that, I need to define the concept of D separation, which is uh, it's not super complicated, but in the first time you see it, it takes a little bit to Digest. So let me go through it slowly. And if you have any questions, please ask. So I need a few definitions. The first one is the easy a path. You have a path from A to B, it's a path of length N. That means that you're going to use N edges. That's why I start from zero and end at N that go from A to B. But the, the important part of the path is that it's not a directed path necessarily. So the path can change direction on the edges. So for example, I can have one, two, three, four, five. So this will be a path from one to five. And you can see the direction of the edges um, doesn't matter. That's the difference between a path and a directed path as we've had before when we're looking at uh, lambda, identity minus lambda inverse, for example. And a collider is a triple, yeah, so a collider is the, the vertex that's in the middle of a triple where A and B both point to the same guy. So that's what we call a collider. If there is no edge between A and B, this collider is called unshielded, and otherwise it's called shielded. Okay, so if you have a graph like this, this is an unshielded collider. And this would be a shielded collider. Okay, so uh, on shielded and shielded. Okay, so that's the definition. And what else do I need? Well, we define parents. Everybody's comfortable with parents. But I actually need to define ancestors. And ancestors is what you would expect. <laughs> Someone is your ancestor. If there is a directed path from that ancestor to you, and we denote this A and B, the set of ancestors. So these are ancestors of B. Okay, does that make sense? So this means that you have an A, and then you have a sequence all in with the same direction that ends in B. And then the set, if you have a set C, I denote ancestors of C. Do we just the union over all the, the ancestors for every element C? Okay. Are there any questions about these things, about these concepts? So far, so good. Great. 
So now comes the tricky part. So let me, I'm gonna just cut it <laughs> and paste it. I didn't want to have everything, you know, look more intimidating if everything is together. <laughs> so here is the main definition. Consider a DAG. We take two vertices that are different. We say they are deconnected by a set C that doesn't contain A and B. If there exists a path that I'm going to call pi from A to B with two properties. The first property is that every collider on the path, it's either in C or in the ancestors of C. And every non-collider on the path cannot be in C. OK, so that's it. I, I, I warned you, it was a little bit hard to process the first time you see it. But this is the definition. So this is the definition for two nodes to be deconnected. If this is the case, we say that the path is active relative to C. And otherwise, so if this is not the case, if one of these two conditions is violated, we say that pi is blocked by C. So we actually are blocking the path through C. And now the big, big main definition is this. For three sets, A, B, and C, pairwise disjoint, we say that C D separates A from B, or another way to say it is that A is D separated from B by C. And we denote it like this. So A, B, and C, and A and B are D separated. G is to the term to say that the graph is there <laughs> from C um, by C. And what does that mean? Well, that means that all the paths from, that you can have from A to B are blocked by C. And this is for any little a in a and every little b in b. Any path that you, that you can create from a to b, um, they're all blocked by c. And that's when we say that c d separates a from b. OK, so as, as I said, this is uh, maybe a bit much. So let's do examples. <laughs> and so I have prepared some examples for you. And the first one is here. Let's consider this graph. Uh, again, uh, this is too low. But you cannot see. Example. Yeah, you can't see mm. the puzzle. Maybe you can move the example to the next page. Maybe. Yeah, maybe I'll do that. Well, I want to keep the definitions yeah, because definition. otherwise. Uh... Maybe on one side. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, okay, maybe. Okay. I, maybe these definitions are easy, I think. So this yeah. I will move. Uh, I'm going to. Um, wait. Um... I could shrink them or something. Okay, I'm just, just in case, I'm gonna put them here. And then, yeah, so, yeah, so that you can actually see the full example. Is that okay? Do you see there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. Okay, so um, let's look at the graph on the left. So the first ones I'm gonna help you. I'm gonna tell you the answer and explain why it's true. And then the second one, I want to leave as an exercise, you know, in real life to see how well you understood it. <laughs> so, but let's do this together. Then the left one. So A and E, D. The question is, if I take the set A to be just a singleton A, and then E, and then D is my C. So the question is, are A and D, i.e. D connected or not, or D separated? Right, or is the, and well, so we need to look at the paths. And there are, in this case, there are two paths from A to E. There's this one and this one. And you can see that both of them pass through D. And D is a non collider, right? So remember, collider is that the two arrows point like this. This doesn't happen in this case. And so since D is part of, um, no, D is part of the conditioning set, that means that, um, <laughs> what does that mean? So every collider, there are no colliders, 
So they are um, not here. And every non collider cannot be in C. So this is not fulfilled, right? Because the collider, the non collider is actually in C. Therefore, this means that these two chains are blocked. And therefore, this means that these are separated. So A is D separated from E by D. And you can start to build the intuition. So why is it true that it's separated? Because you're conditioning on it, and it kind of breaks the flow. That's the idea. It breaks the flow, so you cannot go from A to E. You need to pass through D. And G is a non-collider. OK. <laughs> now, uh, A, E, and C. So now, if I look at C, C is blocking this, this path here. But the other path now is unblocked. It's just going directly. And so this path will actually connect A and E. And C is not going to matter. Therefore, these are connected, which means that this is not separated. Let's look at another example. Let's do B, C, and A. So let's say B, C, and A. So now this is interesting because uh, there is a path that goes like this, that goes C, A, B, for example, or B, A, C. Remember, it's a path, not a directed path. Um, but now A is here. A is not a collider. So that's, um, that's good. And if it's not a collider, we see that it is, again, in C. And therefore, it is blocking. Um, it is in C, so it's blocking. And there is another path, which is this one, C, D, B. And D now is a collider. This is our first example with a collider. And D is a collider. And so now the question is, well, is this collider in C? No. It's not, and it's also not in the ancestors of C, because the ancestor of C is empty. It's just A. I, A has no ancestors, right? So that means that um, it doesn't satisfy this again, which means that the, the pi is blocking, and then we have the D separation. So, OK, these are the first examples. Let's do three more. So what happens now if I add um, f? If I add f, it seems like, OK, it doesn't. I mean, f is all the way here, right? It doesn't. There is even no, there is no direct, there is no path that goes from c to b that goes through, through f, because I cannot go back, right? So it's only allowed, like, you cannot repeat um, vertices, um, you cannot repeat edges in the path. So you can C, D, B. F is like all the way down here. But <laughs> now you can see that F, once you add F here, um, D is a collider. And D is an ancestor of F. It's actually a parent of F, which means that automatically this will satisfy this first equation. Every, every, every is the condition. Every collider is going to be in C, union ancestral of C. And the non-colliders are not there. So the, you can see there are no, no other nodes in this case, C, E, B. And um, the other one here, the other uh, possible path, we have the same uh, situation because A here is an ancestor of F. It's all the way up here, and F is down here, but A is an ancestor of F. So that means that the two possible chains that we can have, this one and this one, both of them, they have, um, they are both, um, so we say, okay, but actually uh, that one is blocked, okay. But this one is not blocked. This one connects, that's the important one. This one connects. So this one is fine, but this one connects. And so therefore, since it's connecting, it's not it's separate. Um, okay, so one, my last two examples are A, B, E, F versus D. So now to have, you can have more than one, just not singletons. So A, B, and F. 
and then D is here. And you can see that D separates these two, like all the, all the paths that you can make from A, B to E, F. D is, uh, yeah, D is, is going to be uh, separating. And then this one, they cannot be D separated because, for example, we already saw that uh, here, A and E are not D separated. So A and E are connected through C, and A is here, and E is here, and C is here. So just by knowing this, I automatically know this. Okay, so I hope it was, I said, I, I warned you to be a bit, so don't be discouraged if you get a bit confused, because I think the issue is that there are all these negations, right? It's like collider, and it's like non-collider, it's not in C, and the separation is the opposite of connection. So all these negations, I think, uh, or maybe it's just me, but I, I, at first I got, I got confused and I still can get confused sometimes. Carlos, why we don't name it as B connected? What's the role of D? Ah, that's a good question. So D is from directed, from direction, because uh, the graph we're looking at is a directed graph. So there is, there is a version for, it's like a U connected or U separated, which is for the undirected graph. Yeah, that's a good question. So it's D because of directed. Okay, so the exercise uh, for you is to, for this other graph, I give you six statements like this, and the question is, are these D separated or not? Right, like just fill it out. I don't know that, so. Originally, I wanted to um, give you some time uh, to do it. Um, like maybe no. <laughs> But uh, three uh, minutes. Five. Carlos, maybe, uh, maybe can you give an idea about the empty work? So A is independent of B given the condition empty set? Ah, sure. So here, yeah, I yeah, choose yeah. C to be the empty set. Yeah. So that means that, um, yeah, I just ask, are they independent or not? Uh, are A and B independent or not? So the definition works the same. So you have to look, so this is A. Okay, let's do it together, uh, now that Imran asked. So A like and B are here. And the question is, <clears throat> every path that you can do from A to B, uh, C is the empty set. So um, when you look at the chains, you have to... Um, so e is a collider in between. Exactly, E is a collider in this case. And this collider is clearly not in C because C is empty. Yeah. <laughs> right? And, and, and so, collider. and D is all very good. Yeah. <laughs> That's the other path. D is also a collider, which is also not in C because, it's, again, C is the empty set. And so, um, yeah. So that means that these two, uh, these two chains are, are, are blocked, right? Yeah. And so being blocked, and, and these are the only two chains, actually. So, okay, so Imran already solved it uh, for you, the first one. These are D separated. Because the two possible chains are blocked by these colliders. Yeah. That are not in C. Okay, very good. And maybe I already maybe give one more thing. But what happens if you add F, now these colliders, for example, is an uh, is in the ancestral set, right? It's a parent of F, so um, that will complicate things a bit, and they will. I mean, it will connect. So this the, the answer here is no. Okay, so I, I, don't know, I, I think, I hope everybody is maybe trying on their own to decide uh, these statements and then I'll check, we'll check it too. So uh, what's with the um, timing? Should we, because we started quite late, but, um, well, maybe I will try to go maybe like 10 more minutes and, and then we can, then we can go to the break. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so okay. you can have fun <laughs> with the separation and um,
can anyone, maybe if someone in someone in the participants, can someone maybe they already know the answer to one of these and they can explain why? I so tell them, okay, it's this separated or it's not separated, and they can tell us why. So either, right? So if it's not separated, you need to find a path that is active, right? And if you claim they are separated, you need to, to say that all the paths are blocked, right? So that's the difference. Uh, one is existing a path, the other one is show all paths are blocked. So, okay, is there anyone uh, brave to explain one of these? The last one is not. AC. The last one is not. not. Okay, why? That's um, correct. Because uh, D is block. Uh, so is that, no, if you're saying if you're saying e, that it's not, e, e that is means block. that e is block too. E here. Okay, so I'm looking at A C versus B. Yeah. So if E is a collider. E is a collider. And this collider is in Side in C. Position. Yeah. Yeah. So that means that it's 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 connecting, right? It's it's active. So this this path, if you take this path, this is an active path that connects A to B. And so just by that, uh, we know that it's not separated. Okay, very good. Uh, anyone else uh, for the remaining ones? And I think it's nice if we discuss it because then if there is any you know, question or like misconception of how it works, then we can solve it now. But I mean, of course, I'm also available later if you have any questions. But um, uh, Can you explain the DEBC? So I think B is the ancestor of both. Yes, okay, D, E, B, C. Okay, let's look uh, at it. So I'm looking at D, E, yeah. and B, C. So, okay, yeah. so okay, B, C is my conditioning set, and I'm looking at a path from E to D. Yeah. Uh, so the paths here, they both go through C and B, yeah, right? Both are the ancestors. And, uh, and C and B are, um, they are not colliders. But they are ancestors, ancestors yeah. um, of BC, of course. Yeah. So BC are there, right? Yeah. And so this means that they are blocking. So not independent. Then, no, since they are blocked, that means they are de-separated. They are de-separated. So, they, exactly. So, so then this is de-separated. Yeah. Uh -oh. They are de-separated. So why, why, why? Uh, so ancestor for ancestor it is allowed. Uh, they so, are not blocked. They are not blocked. It is blocked, right? Because if you look at this one, let's say look at this at this path. Yeah. Uh, yeah. B is a non-collider, and it's in C, so it, it's it's not satisfying this condition. Okay. Okay. So this means that the pi is blocked. And the other option, which would be doing this, also the C is there. Okay. okay so okay. it's blocking. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, I it just, takes a little I bit of practice. The, that if the path is going through the ancestor, then ancestor should be. So, but uh, when one of the path is going through the ancestor, what yeah. uh, we have to take care yeah, of? It, yeah. So the, 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 the important thing is whether it's a collider or not. Right? Okay, so that's okay, going to be okay. the big difference. Got so it. if it's a collider, then it's important to, to, to know where the ancestors, the ancestors of C. If it's a non-collider, it just, you just need that it's not in C. Uh, okay. And in this case, these are non-colliders. So, yeah. Got it. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, the answer. The answer is here it is de-separated, and here it's not. Okay, and you can check it on your own. And... Uh, yeah, hopefully then you convince yourselves. So why do we define all of this? Okay, well, uh, why uh, why D is not uh, D separated to E here? Yeah. Okay, let's uh, look at it. So uh, D and E through yeah. A and B. The reason is that I can find uh, E C D 
right? There is a path, this path, that yeah. goes from E to D, and C is a non-collider yeah. that, um, oh wait, is in, but, yeah. Think? That's a non-collider that is not in C, right? Yeah. And then every collider is in C, G, and C. Oh no, wait, I, I guess this one is the one that I want. Yeah. So, sorry. Okay, E, D, yeah, I think if you just look at this. Yeah. This one is connecting, right? It's a, it's a, it's a part that connects E and E. Yeah, yeah, it's connecting yeah. E and E, yeah. Yeah, and so therefore they cannot be separated, right? It's not blocked. B is in C. Uh, what because is B because B is a non-collider and B is in C. Ah, okay, 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 okay. So now it, I got it. it. Okay. It doesn't okay. satisfy this this this. Okay, 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 okay. So yeah, okay. Got yeah, it. it takes a bit of practice. I have to say, it takes a yeah, bit of practice. Yeah, yeah. But once you once you know this. This is great because now we have the big theorem, which is what I want to tell you. So why is it worth it to understand the separation? Well, because of this following theorem. And the theorem says, if you have a DAG, the GPD, the DAG, and A, B, and C disjoint, then XA is going to be condition independent of XB given XC uh, for every uh, distribution that is in your model, sigma, sigma in NG, right? So this conditional independent statement holds for all your distributions in the model associated to G, if and only if. A B separates. Uh, A is D separated from B by C in the graph. So it's a completely combinatorial criterion to determine whether you're going to have such a statement in your model. It's an if and only if. And um, in particular, what does this mean for algebra? Right. So in particular, if you observe this, this separation in the graph, then that means that the all cardinality C plus one minors of the matrix uh, A union C, B union C lie in the ideal. All right, so all of those minors had to appear in IG in this ideal. So just by looking at this. And if you go back now to our previous examples, then you'll see um, that was exactly what was happening, right? So um, yeah. like, for example, this, this cycle like this, you can see that in this case, two is separated from three by one. And uh, one is separated from four by two, three. And by the way, if you are a bit confused about this, I mean, you want to actually have all the statements, there is a Macaulay two function that does that too. So let me maybe show you. Um, uh, uh, by, by the previous example, two is not D separated by one because one is a non-collider. One is a non-collider that is in C. That is in C. Uh, so it violates this. Not collider, not in C. Ah, okay, 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 okay. Not in C. Okay. Not in C. Exactly. Okay. Not in C. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> no problem. So let me then here. Um, in this example, oh, yeah, so this is exactly the example. That's great. So I don't need to reload anything. So I just I can just say uh, netlist global markup G. 
and it tells you the two statements. So the way it orders them is A, B, C. So it tells you there are two statements here, one separated from four by two, three, and two separated from three by one. And so, uh, and you can do this for any graph. The command is global markup. And the reason is because this is called the global markup property in, in, in graphical models. Um, yes. So this is good. And to, by, let's say, yeah, to um, completely fulfill everything I wrote in the abstract for, my, for the course. So if you go to the course, I said, OK, we're going to discuss all these networks, and we're going to talk about uh, the vanishing ideals, and we're going to talk about the likelihood geometry and the algebraic identifiability. So I tried to do everything. And um, there was one thing that I said, like, even we're going to discuss how to the, uh, you know, um, re how does one recover the graph from data? And so I'm just going to say a sentence about this, which is these conditions allows us, these are useful for learning the graph from data, right? So uh, these restrictions or conditions, right? These um, restrictions are useful for learning G. So, so far we have assumed that G is always known, but what if we are given data? So that means, can create these sigmas, we can find the sigmas, and the question is, what is the correct graph, right? And so one way to do this is by doing conditional independence testing. So you can check, there are ways to check whether your variable two is independent of three given one, right? So you can say, okay, I know this is true. So then that means that you should find a graph where this is the separation statement holds. And the same here, right? So you can say, oh, from data, I know that one and four are independent given to three. And then you know, well, then I should find a graph that has this property with the separation. And then you can do a bit of, uh, well, there is an actual algorithm that does this, the PC algorithm is called. And um, well, you can also do some trial and error and try to find what, a, what is a graph that is consistent with your statements and then only with those statements. And basically this will allow you to recover your graph, right? So, in, and algebra, how do you check this? Well, we know there is an actual algebraic way to check in this, right? Thanks to this. So that's how the algebra is going to help us and say, well, are these minors zero or not? And then um, that will, you know, lead to this, which leads to this. So everything is a very nice interplay, and that's um, basically that's the goal of what I wanted to show you a bit in this course. Um, how, um, yeah, you know, there is the interaction within probability, the statistics, uh, algebra, and combinatorics, right? So, and that's, I, that's, I think, a good, uh, I would say, example of algebraic statistics, and hopefully that, uh, you know, gives you a little bit of perspective into this field, and I hope you, you enjoy it, <laughs> and yeah, I'm yeah. happy to... Yeah, answer any questions. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos. Thank you very much. Just clap for Carlos for very elaborating lecture. Uh, Carlos, uh, may you please, uh, uh, toward the end, may you please mention some graduate text for uh, for the beginner who might be interested in exploring more in this particular direction? Yes, so the uh, I think the best reference uh, to start everything, so it's, it's the is the book by Sullivan. So Algebraic Statistics. Um, this is just the title of Algebraic Statistics by Seth Sullivan. And there is, um, there in this book, so this is a nice textbook that has everything you want. And in this book, there are two important chapters for us. So you can look, read, what most of what I talked about during the course is chapter 13, graphical models. And uh, yeah, I think this one has um, everything, like uh, even more than what I said. And um, yes, I would recommend this chapter 13. And I mean, since it's a book, it's very well done. I mean, I really like this book. 
and it has lots of references. So you will see there many papers. Um, if you want, I also in the abstract on the Simpa website, if you look at them, I added uh, four references, I believe. One of them is this for sure. And there are other ones that are very concrete to these problems that we discussed. Yeah, there are many, many further topics, uh, which I don't have time to tell you about, but um, I mean, just for example, you can, as I said, you, you may look at graphs that are not only directed, but also bi-directed, where there are edges that are like this, and that corresponds to hidden variables. That's, uh, if you want to learn about this, it's chapter 14, uh, hidden variables. And this makes things much more interesting because now basically what happens is that the omega matrix that we've been doing, it's not diagonal anymore. So you can have things that are non-diagonal, and this adds a lot of richness to the algebra and the geometry as well. And so, um, yeah, you can le learn about this, this chapter, and uh, then there are many open problems there. For example, characterizing these ideals when you have uh, this non-diagonal case. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you very much for uh, introducing this subject, and this subject is new to I think every one of us, including myself. So I I think uh, being a good ambassador of algebraic statistics, you have been quite successful in your lecture. Congratulations. Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you, thank you. Are there any questions or comments from the audience side? Yeah, uh, in Karachi, uh, Danish? No questions. No questions. Well. Okay, now uh, the serious comment is that now we we are going to have a break and uh, batteries, uh, uh, I think we can start in next 15 minutes at 11.15. Batres, can you shorten your lecture in 45 minutes? Okay. Yes, you can. She can? Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. okay well, everything. Thank uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos, for coming to Pakistan, and uh, we wish you safe travel. And uh, hope uh, uh, that uh, we will have you once again. And uh, hope this Simpa School will become one of the reason that uh, this area got uh, more attention in this region of Pakistan as well as uh, the by the participant of uh, this Simpa School can take up this particular project. And maybe yes. someday you can see one paper coming out of. Uh, uh, that will be amazing. That, that will be amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for hosting. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope so too. Okay. Clap for clap for a break and uh, let's uh, get together at eleven fifteen. I think so. It's a very short break, fifteen minutes. <laughs>